All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so today, Anne and I are going to give you a repeat showing of a session that we did as a closing session for the Athen conference a couple of weeks ago. So the conference was all about math accessibility. And so let me share my screen and we'll get started. All right, so um, we're a fairly small group. I'm comfortable with you just coming on the mic, asking questions. Um, if you want to put questions in the chat or put comments in the chat, we have those open as well. So today we're talking about math in my world, accessibility through choice of assessment. So we're gonna start with a little bit of theory, looking at universal design for learning and authentic assessment. And then Anne is going to take over and talk about uh, the practical aspects of alternative assessments, student engagement, teaching for mastery, uh, the personal finance course to create connections, and lots and lots of examples and opportunities for you to ask questions. So um, I think we've met most of you or all of you at this point in time. So I'm Marisha Marks. I'm an instructional designer with the Center for Online and digital learning. And I think all of you know Anne Simeo from the math department. So let's jump into the theory. So when I talk about universal design for learning, I like to start with this graphic that talks about the historical applications as well as what we're striving towards. So what we see here is three children that are trying to watch a baseball game. Initially, they're all standing on the same size wooden crates, and the shortest child is not able to see any of the action. This is what may happen in a traditional classroom when a student with a disability comes into the class and is not able to access some of the resources that are provided, some of the learning materials that are provided in the course. So then that student would go to the Office of Disability Services and ask for an accommodation. Those accommodations are retroactive and they take time, but resources are also limited. So it's not that he can just be given an extra crate. Resources are redistributed where the tallest child now no longer has a crate. The shortest child is now standing on two crates. Seemingly, it seems like this is an equitable distribution of resources. Everybody can see the baseball game, but we don't know, does that tallest child feel resentment towards the shortest child because his crate was taken away. Does the shortest child uh, feel like he might fall off of those two really high crates or does he need help getting up onto the crates? Did he miss a key play while he was waiting to get the second crate? So then we can think about how can we remove the barriers? What are the barriers to learning? So the barrier to learning in this case is the wooden fence the wooden fence is exchanged for a chain link fence. Now all children can see the baseball game right away without the need for crates to stand on. Now this is an analogy. It's a start to a conversation because what we really wanna think about is how can we make this experience even more authentic, even better for the children? Can we get them into the stands so that they're actually part of the action? Can we make it even more inclusive learning opportunity for the children without the need for any of the retroactive modifications. So when we approach courses with universal design for learning thinking, we try to remove the need for accommodations and modifications. We try to eliminate stigma. And we also try to help learners with different learning preferences. So the Office of Disability Services only serves students with documented disabilities. So when we think about something like closed captioning, that is designed for students with a hearing impairment. And if you have audio recordings, the Office of Disability Services would provide closed captioning for a student who had a hearing impairment. But closed captions serve a much broader population of students. Um, here at STIC, we have students who speak a variety of different languages, and sometimes reading text is easier to understand than uh, listening to spoken text if English is not your first language. 
or maybe you're just studying in an environment where you uh, can't turn on the audio. Maybe you have a sleeping child next to you, or maybe you're in a quiet library and you forgot your headphones. So those clo closed captions, they serve a much broader population than just the students who would be served by the Office of Disability Services. Um, the other tool that we have at STIC is Ally in Blackboard that uh, provides students with alternative formats. So those alternative formats would give students um, a uh, MP3 audio for a text uh, that may be uploaded to Blackboard. The Ally in Blackboard can also do language translations. So if students have a preferred language other than English, they can use Ally to create that automatically generated language translation that would help them, uh, them learn. So as we strive for uh, universal design for learning and application of that in our courses, we want to set and communicate clear and flexible goals. We want to make sure that all students know what the direction that they're going, what are they trying to learn, and uh, how are they going to get there? Want to provide as much flexibility in terms of the materials as possible. So, uh, with something like Ally, we're giving students the option to have both a text based learning material and an audio based learning material. Uh, in designing courses, you can take that a step further by finding videos for uh, the learning materials and also by providing flexibility for ways for students to demonstrate their learning. So uh, can students use different forms of representation in terms of presenting the material back to demonstrate that they've met the learning outcomes? Uh, in demonstrate in uh, looking for that flexibility, you also want to make sure that you're including as much accessibility as possible. So evaluating the materials for accessibility to remove any potential barriers and also optimize the number of choices. So in giving students choice and flexibility in how they demonstrate their learning, sometimes um, we might uh, create so many choices that students are over overwhelmed by all of the decision-making that they have to do. Or maybe there's a traditional assessment that has very detailed instructions and the alternative assessment then just gives students the option to come up with their own project, which again can be uh, very overwhelming and uh, harder for students to actually make use of that, that opportunity. Uh, we strive for authentic assessments. So authentic assessments are going to allow students to create a more personal connection to their learning. It's gonna be more culturally relevant where students can see themselves and the application of the learning to their own lives, to their own communities. So uh, they'll be able to take the learning and they'll be able to apply it to their own everyday life to create those connections. And finally, I wanted to talk to you about constructs. So constructs are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that demonstrate that a student has met the learning goals. So I remember sitting in uh, my high school class uh, preparing for upcoming SATs and being told that if I hold my number two pencil at exactly the right angle, and if I complete the bubble sheet in an oval pattern starting from the outside and working in, that'll be the fastest way for me to respond to the questions. And I will save valuable time for uh, using that time to, to answer further questions. So the construct of uh, completing the bubble sheet is irrelevant to the learning outcomes. The construct of uh, filling in the bubble sheet doesn't show the college admissions team whether I'm actually going to be a good student. It doesn't demonstrate my knowledge of math, my knowledge of reading, writing, any of that. So in developing assessments, we want to look at what are the constructs, which constructs are relevant and which constructs are irrelevant 
to the learning outcomes. So uh, in higher education, there is that ubiquitous uh, research paper. So many courses have a research paper as one of the assessments, um, either at the midterm or the final level. If uh, your course requires writing as one of its learning outcomes, a demonstration of the ability to write, then a research paper is a great way to assess students. But sometimes in a history course or a sociology course, we're not really looking to assess student writing. We're looking to assess students' understanding of a concept or their ability to interpret information or compile information. And maybe they could do that in a way other than something that really focuses on their ability to write. In math, the same thing comes up with memorization of formulas. So do students need the instant recall of the formula or do they need to be able to apply the formula? Do they need to be able to solve problems using the formula or do they need to derive the formula? So looking at in greater detail, what is it that the learning outcome actually asks for? What are those constructs? We can give students more flexibility. Another construct that comes up is time. The time to complete an assessment, th that timed test where students have to have an uninterrupted block of time. Some students are going to do great with that because they can focus, they can do their assessment, and then they're done. But for other students, it may be really challenging to find an uninterrupted hour because maybe they have family obligations where they can only work in short chunks of time. Or maybe the student experiences eye fatigue. And again, they need to work a little bit and then take a break. So giving students more flexibility in how they demonstrate their learning and not putting the emphasis on the amount of time that they spend or the amount of uninterrupted time that they spend on completing the assessment. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Are there any questions uh, related to kind of the, the foundation of universal design for learning where we're, we're going with this? Then if there's no questions, then I'm going to stop my screen share and Anne is going to take over. So in practice, um, what we want to talk about is some of the different ways. So when I like to start with a comic here, um, when will I ever use this? And um, see, math isn't so bad. Dad, will I ever use this stuff in real life? Absolutely. One day you'll have to help your own children with the math homework. And the reality is, is we use math so much throughout our everyday lives. And um, the class that I'm gonna focus a lot of this on is math in modern society, which is where we're really talking about how math applies in the world around us. Um, but we can do it in pieces in some of our other classes as well. So what, in my opinion, we need to do is adjust our mindset. So change our mindset as a teacher from having students just sit in complete formulas that they memorized and um, to using some type of assessment where students can have the flexibility to demonstrate the mastery of learning outcomes. So when, for me, in Math 101, I sat and I watched um, the first couple of times I taught the class, students struggling to calculate compound interest by hand. So I need to divide this part. I need to multiply um, this part. I need to make sure I put in my calculator correctly and follow my order of operations. And I asked myself, what are these students really and truly going to do with this after they leave? And it's the personal finance section. So to me, that was part of um, when I really started to think about outside of the box and certain classes, where can we move with these um, students and having them go from formulas to how do they apply it in their real life. So personalized assessments linked to real life scenarios add relevance and engagement. So one of the things that we're doing, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but the personal finance section, the students now create a budget. They 
It's all supposed to be hypothetical, but they have income, they have expenses, they have to save for an item. They still have to apply their compound interest because they have to calculate what the payment is going to be for how far out they want to buy that item. So they're still using all their mathematical formulas that they have to, but they're doing it in a way that's going to apply to their life and they can see the meaning of it. So it's answering that question of when will we ever use this? So out of the box assessments is when we create assessments where we put the guidelines out there, we give them a rubric, we tell them what we want them to do, they have calculations that are required, but students basically go in their own direction. They decide where, what direction they want to go in. So yes, it is a lot more work to, to, um, to grade these pieces because it's not one standard answer key. It's a matter of every student has a different answer key depending on the direction that they went in. Allow students to demonstrate the mastery without the need for time requirements and other typical accommodations. So for me, students in my classes, what I've always strived for them to be able to do is hand me um, an, ex an accommodation and I can basically say, <coughs> excuse me, that you, like it should be all set, let me know if there's anything I can do, but I try to have um, various forms of ways for them. They have readings, they have videos, they have examples, they have different ways that they can learn the material and not just one. As far as when we have the assessments, I try to give them that time requirement that they don't need extra time because um, with an assessment, they don't, they can take all the time that they want. They're doing that part of it on their own. And then I also allow students to resubmit the assessments. Um, this is learning from mastery. To me, um, I learned, this was one of the things that when I went back for the master's in education, um, we talked a lot and we learned a lot about learning from mastery. And it's what the students walk out of our classroom with. It's not can on February 2nd, they could do chapter one. On March 3rd, they could do chapter two. It's when they leave my classroom, can they show me and can they demonstrate mastery of all my learning outcomes? So that's why I feel like allowing them to resubmit the assessments. And a lot of students will tell me the amount that they learned by being able to resubmit the assessments because where they were struggling the first time through, and then I give them feedback to say, hey, this is what you should do, go in this direction. And the amount that students learn um, is a lot because we all know, we've all talked about the fact of our brains grow when we make mistakes. So when the students have to think about redoing a piece of it, they're really thinking and they're trying their best to be successful. And the big part for me is that demonstrating mastery of course outcomes. So what can the students take with them when they leave my classroom and teaching for mastery by allowing those resubmissions to meet those learning outcomes. So it is more work because you're regrading um, the same assignments from the same student. You're not sitting down and grading all of assessment one at the same time because some students are going to submit it a little bit later and you might be grading their assessment one while you're grading another student's assessment two um, along with their assessment two. So some of the fun things that you can incorporate. So um, this side right here is it's a simple interest game. So I used to hand out a, basically a piece of paper and it had 20 different simple interest questions on it and the students had to calculate the different pieces. So this is still doing the same exact thing. They still have to calculate the simple interest. They still have to know what the principle is. They still have to know the interest. They still need to know that time is in years. And then they actually have to be able to make money and make change with it because they have to use the dollars and the coins in order to submit what their answer is going to be. It goes through 10 questions. And part of that learning from mastery is they can redo this simple interest game until they get the score that they want. So for some students, they're happy with a 60. Some students will do it until they get 100, but those students are redoing those problems over and over again. So this is like a homework assignment that instead of them taking the piece of paper home, getting frustrated and not understanding if they got it right or wrong, they get instant feedback that tells them great work or they can redo it. And what they do is they take a screenshot at the end and that's gonna be the grade for their simple interest calculations. So for my personal finance, so I touched a little bit this, um, on this earlier, they create a home budget. 
So over the first couple of weeks, um, what they do is they go through and I recommend for them to write down their expenses. Where do you spend your money? So a lot of students, um, the number of subscriptions for Netflix and Hulu and you name it. And a lot of these students completely forgot that they had those subscriptions. And then they also during the discussion boards or classroom discussions when we're in person, what we do is various assignments are you go to a bank website, any bank website. So the number of credit unions, Bank of America, um, you name it, and they have to determine, they have to research interest rates, but they also have to give all the caveats. What are the fees? Are there restrictions? Are there age restrictions? If you're a student, are some of those things waived? A lot of students never knew that they can look at interest rates for different places. The next week, they have to do the same thing, except it's with car loans. Look at the car loan, look at the interest period, look at the interest rate. Um, they also then do it on credit cards. What is the credit card um, fees? What is the interest rate on those credit cards? And then we talk, then there's a discussion about, well, why are these things so different? Why is that savings rate so low? Why is that credit card rate so high? So one of the things that they have to do is they basically, during their final assessment with this budget, besides the income expenses, they also have to find an item that they wanna buy. When do you wanna buy it? How much is it gonna cost? how much is the payment gonna be if I finance it with that credit card versus if I'm basically just saving the money along the way. A lot of students have never been taught the difference in if you save that money versus the amount of interest you're gonna pay at the end of the day. Um, I do give them the note that I want them to use hypothetical numbers. If you wanna use your actual numbers, that's perfectly fine. Um, but tell me that they're hypothetical. I'm not looking to get into your personal life I'm not looking to look at your finances. I do have some students that reach out and say, I live with my parents and I don't have a job. I don't know what to do. So what I recommend for those students to do is the career they wanna get into. What is, um, like, what is the average salary for that? Use that as your income. Look at rent for different places. Ask your parents how much the electricity bill, how much um, different bills that they have. Um, grocery bills, et cetera. So, and a lot of those students say, this is great because I've never thought to look at these things before. And so some of those comments that I get from students, it may be time for me to start looking at my accounts from a different perspective because they've never looked at them before. Overall, my budget had some surprises, but I'm happy that I learned what will work for me in the future and what I can change now. So a lot of them realize that when they go get their nails done, when they go to the mall, when they go out on the weekend, um, when they pick up that cup of coffee, the amount of money that they're spending that a lot of them don't have. And then and this was tremendously helpful. And creating a budget was something I've been telling myself to do for years now. While I've always thought about it as a daunting task and somehow convinced myself that it's too complicated to get done, I now see I was completely wrong and misinformed. So some of the other things that the students will do, so I have different um, budgeting ideas out there, different budgeting spreadsheets that the students can use as examples. But on the other hand of it too, um, a lot of the students will share different apps that they use for budgeting and determining how to save their money or spend their money. Um, during the statistics section, what I have them do is um, they have to find a news article or a blog, and it has to have at least two statistical statements of things that we studied throughout the course um, through the section of this, and they have to explain the article and also those two statistics, how they were calculated and how they impact the article. So you have to go on beyond just how to calculate it, but understand why it's presented in the way it is. And a lot of the students, it pushes them out of the box to find an article. Right now, there's so many um, articles out there that it's easy for a lot of the students to find them. And it makes them look at some of the information that they're hearing in a different way because now they understand the statistics behind it. Um, the bin packing example. Um, so students work for a company and they have to pack those bins. So a lot of them will talk about jobs that they have and they never realized that um, the methods that they were following actually had um, a relevance um, and a methodology behind it. Circuit examples. This one's a lot of fun. So students choose five addresses and it says in their neighborhood, but I can tell I tell them they can do whatever they want. 
and they need to choose <clears throat> that something's going to get delivered and the purpose of the deliveries, but then they have to find that most efficient route. They apply both nearest neighbor and sorted edges to figure out what the most efficient route is. So this one was Daryl's trip around the world. So he didn't just do his um, own neighborhood. He wanted to go to London. He wanted to go to Thailand. He wanted to go to South Africa. He wanted to go to Argentina and he was starting in Boston. And so um, he gave me the map. He made um, the every, every place, um, all the different possibilities. He looked up what those miles were and then he applied both nearest neighbor and sorted edges to determine his most, most efficient route. And um, so he chose the trip around the world. Some students choose to do something in the neighborhood, but we're getting the students to think out of the box. We're having them do something other than just looking at a diagram on a piece of paper and they're all doing the same exact thing. <laughs> Daryl is awesome. <laughs> and so final exam. Um, this was actually kind of interesting because I originally had only an alternative assessment. And what I ended up doing was last summer, I had the opportunity to do the summer equity symposium. And I had three times students email me to ask me for a traditional final exam. And at the time, I the only one I had was the paper one um, that I had used prior to changing to some of the assessments. Um, don't get me wrong, one thing I do want to point out, students still take traditional quizzes, they still have matching type of pieces, they still have um, quizzes as they're going through. So it's not all the assessments, it's not all fun and games. Um, there is a crossword puzzle with statistical terminology, but it's a mixture of traditional, here's mathematical problems that you have to solve, find my mean, find my median, find my mode, find my standard deviation, find um, my quartiles. They still have to go through that part of calculations, but they also have at the end those assessments. The final exam though, um, one of the things that I was able to see, I was given the benefit of having the grades um, for all of my students over the past few years. And what I noticed was a lot of the questions that were coming through actually were, uh, that were asking for the final exam actually came from a same ethnic group. And so one of the things that I find actually now that I have the choice of the traditional final examination or that alternate um, assessment for the final, I'd say it's about 50-50 where half the students do a traditional final exam and half the students do an alternate assessment um, for that final. Um, so it's pretty interesting as we go through. Um, so some alternate assessment ideas for some of my other classes. For statistics, um, I don't believe I'm the only one that does this, where we do projects. I think almost all of us do this. We collect, they have, we have students determine what the question is gonna be, collect the data, and they're summarizing using everything that they learned throughout the semester. They have to do a frequency distribution chart. They have to um, find their mean, median, mode, standard deviation. They have to do a confidence interval. They have to do hypothesis testing. And then they have to write a one to two page paper explaining what those conclusions meant. So they have to explain in words all the um, pieces that they calculated. For mathematical reasoning, which is my education majors, they present a lesson plan as their final project. They choose a topic, we are their students, and we're their math class that they're teaching. They have to come up with their lesson plan. What are they gonna teach? How are they gonna teach it? What handouts are they gonna use? What resources are they gonna use? So some of the other things that I do is <clears throat> journaling. Um, so, this is a way to stay connected with my students. This is a way that I find out, um, a lot of students will tell me, I love the idea of journaling because it's like a forced check-in with me. It's one of those things that when students kind of say, oh, I felt silly about emailing about that. When you reach out to say, like, where is this assignment or what happened here? They'll say, oh, I didn't want to ask you. I thought I was going to be bothering you. No, you're not bothering me email me, let me know. And sometimes they still didn't. So journaling, I have about five journals. Um, I now include it in almost all of my classes, not all of them, but a lot of my classes, I include the journaling and the students love it. Even in the linear algebra Cal classes, they enjoy having that communication. Faculty time management. So as I alluded to earlier, it does take longer to 
correct these. It's not in my open math. It's not in my math lab. It's not in a program that's automatically correcting these things. Um, you need to go in every time you're looking at a new assessment, you have a new answer key. So some of the things that you can do um, is by using those great, um, those, um, you can use the matching within Blackboard. That um, did that piece of it. I have a crossword puzzle that was created. It gets graded automatically. Um, the simple interest rate, that does get graded um, automatically. And so that frees up my time to do what? To, to grade the assessments along the way. The other thing that um, you can do is limit the number of journal entries. Um, you're also not um, going through accommodation letters, going through all different pieces of how to calculate, um, of how to change some of the ways that you're presenting the material because you already went through the time of having videos, of having um, Word documents, things like that. So in conclusion, um, so what we want to kind of really stress is progress over perfection, um, incremental changes. Don't go in and try to change everything at once. Um, I made little changes um, as I was um, going through classes. I, was, I made little changes over time. Um, I add little things to different classes over time, but it's not something that you're going to change overnight. Um, but choose one thing per semester and make that change and see how it works. Because if you try to change everything at the same time, you're gonna find things don't work and then you're gonna to try to rechange everything back to where it was before or just get frustrated. Make sure you're considering all your learners. Um, most of us know that the reality is, is even if we're not handed a piece of paper that our student needs some type of accommodation, a lot of our students do need some type of accommodation. So if we have those resources in place for our students, it allows them the ability to be successful. And the last part is courage to get out of our comfort zone. We were taught in a certain way um, our math classes. Um, we were lectured to, we were given a piece of paper, we we're given a formula, do that, move on to the next topic. Um, for me, it's also a matter of now that I've got a lot of our classes are online, between PhotoMath and SciMath and all these other websites that you can put in a problem and it gives you the answer. Are we really figuring out, do our students know the answer or can they put it into a program for some of them? Or are we forcing this assessment where they have to demonstrate those learning outcomes, that they have to demonstrate the mastery um, along the way? So those were some of the things that I want you guys to think about as you're looking at your courses and different assignments within the courses. Can we change the way that we think about some of the work that we do and how to move forward? Ms. Lauren, you have your hand up. You're on mute. I should know better. And I'm really glad you're talking about this, especially when you got to the statistics part, because one of the things that I feel really strongly about, and I know other folks in my department, I know I realize this isn't all math, is that um, in statistics, there are a ton of formulas. And I really have a problem with making students crunch through formulas for things like standard deviation or correlation coefficient. What a huge waste of time that is because no statistician will ever do that. So allowing the students to, to use multiple ways of calculating something like a standard deviation. I, have, I like to let them use Excel or a Desmos calculator or something. I, I don't even care. To me, it's if they can do the formula. I don't even want to hand them a formula sheet, but I do want them to be able to interpret that for me. So what does this, what does this correlation coefficient mean? You know, that maybe, maybe you calculated it incorrectly, but what does it mean? And I think that's far more important. And I, and I also think it's really unfair to make students crunch through those stupid formulas. It, so you give them five numbers and say, compute a population standard deviation for these five numbers. And I think, why? Show them what it's about, but, but don't, don't let's, let's not talk about the formulas. Let's, let's talk about what it means. Sorry, that's my rant. I have this rant yeah. on. And yeah. so I actually, with Math 101, I actually have them do something similar to that with confidence intervals, where I give them a website and it's a 95% confidence interval. I give them a mean, I give them a standard deviation and they change the sample size. But then they have to give me a 200 word paragraph what is going on and why? 
So basically, as the sample size gets bigger, you get more confidence in your data. The, and, I love that. And that's way more. I want them to get there. Um, Dean Shop has her hand up. Hi, this is Laura. Can you hear me? I can. We can hear you now. Sorry. <laughs> Um, a great job, first of all. So thank you for sharing this. Um, I really like the piece on the journaling. Uh, that's, that's a metacognitive um, exercise that I don't think a lot of students are always familiar with uh, to make them kind of reflect on their learning. Um, and and sometimes that you know can be a way for them to figure out you know where they need to kind of get unstuck, right? Yes. So, uh, do you allow them to also journal by video or audio? You, I have not yet. Um, it, they could because it gets submitted through Blackboard at this point with um, the online piece of it. Um, the, where I actually got the journaling piece was from. Um, Actually, Mary Wiseman um, taught one of my classes when I, so <clears throat> I went back for the master's in ed, but I had also gotten a graduate level certificate in online teaching and Mary taught one of those um, classes and she actually allowed us and she actually did a high, a low, and then what you learned this week. And we could do a video or an audio or a written piece of it. Um, so I probably should um, let them know that if they wanted to do it as an audio, they could. I just never, I guess, even thought to add that into it. But that's a great idea. It, it just, you know, for some students, um, for the writing might be laborious to them, right? So that it could just allow them, especially if it's a reflective kind of piece. Uh, but it's great. And I also, the so the trip activity that you talked about, finding the shortest route, um, I just, I don't know how many people are familiar with operations research, but that is like the basis behind operations research and Q theory. And I'm a big geek about that stuff. So I think that's really cool. And um, if you need references, you know, for how that you know how where will we use that i can give you some so that but thank you the great job thank you mary marianne i think you're just doing an excellent wonderful job i'm so impressed with what you have to say i have two questions related to what you had to say um the first one is the language piece um so many of my students uh in developmental classes really have trouble. I mean, they're at a point I, I find um, they don't even read a word problem. They choose not to do them when they're on a test. So part of my question is, how do you deal with now the journaling? I mean, that's beyond reading. That's writing. That's writing and thinking and, and writing, you know, so it's the word efficient, the, the most efficient way. To, that in itself would be like, wow, for some kids. What, what, what do you mean efficient? The, the So that's part one. The second part is, um, one of my big challenges this year, well, if I teach again this year, is connecting students with each other. Do you ever do any of these projects with a team, you know, like a, a pair or a team? So those are my two questions, language and connection with others. So as far as um, for my grading for the journals, they don't worry about um, like the language piece of it, um, because what I tell them is as long as you share your thoughts with me, I'm going to give you full credit for the journal. So from a language standpoint, it's not a matter of like, punctuation is not there, capitalism, I don't care. I like it can be one big long, uh, long one big run on sentence. Um, what I want them to do is communicate with me. And the reality is, is a lot of the students that do have that broken English or they don't feel comfortable writing, um, they're the ones that aren't going to reach out to me through email. But when they're forced to do it in a journal, um, they'll do it. Because, and the amount of students that will say, thank you for not forcing me to like use proper English. I just, I just need to get this out to you. As far as word problems go, um, I actually, I've always done this where I tell them 
when we were in the math center, um, if it was Spanish, I would send them down to the math uh, center and tell them, have someone down there translate it for you and come back if you need that translation piece. Now that we're online, um, or even for other languages, what I'll do is I'll tell them to go to Google Translate yeah. and let Google Translate change it for you. Um, so the stuff that's in Blackboard, obviously they can do that through Blackboard. Um, however, um, if it's not, if it's just a word problem, if you let them put it into Google Translate, it's not perfect, but a lot of the words are there. Um, so okay. that makes a huge difference. Okay. And the second, I just forgot your second question. The second was connecting with students with each other. Uh, so connecting with each other. So what I do is I have discussion boards in all of my classes. Um, most of my classes, there's only one class that actually has real problems that they have to do um, in the discussion board. Most of my discussion boards, they are there weekly. They have more to do um, in the beginning. What resources did you find in this class helpful? So I found um, these videos here. I found this here and they share that. Another one might be, this was a tough topic. Um, I want you to go out to a website and find a website that's helpful for this topic and share it with your peers. Um, another one would be find one problem from the homework this week and explain it to your peers. And, or it's just a check-in, like what, like how you doing, what's going on this week, <clears throat> but to get a hundred points, you need at least three posts. So you need your initial post and then you have to reply to two peers. And so if they do three or more posts, they get a hundred, two or more posts, they get a 90, one post, they get a 70 because that initial post is, so <clears throat> that's where I get them connecting with each other. So having your first week be an introduction week. Hi, my name is this. This is my major. My I like to um, I like to read, but I'm a hockey mom and a dance mom. So therefore, I spend a lot of time at these places. And so you share that they share that information, and then you start seeing that connection. They start to reply to each other, um, and some of them even within the discussion board will post, "Hey, I want to do a study group. Here's my email. Email me." Um, so it's that discussion board for me that I get that connection with the students. Um, and they really start to, um, one thing you do have to be careful of is you've got to monitor that discussion board. And the reason for it is because if there is a student that's frustrated, especially in those first couple of weeks, what they'll do is they'll elevate everyone's stress level. So if you're in there and you jump in and say, hey, I know you're stressed out, but really try to do like, try this. Did you see this website? Did you see this? Did you um, get on my office hour calendar? Here's the link. And so when you do that, it all of a sudden calms it all down and it's good, but those students aren't festering off by themselves, getting frustrated. Now they have ways to solve their problem. And the same thing happens with when you say, what's a good resource? They'll say, oh, I didn't realize the calendar was there. I didn't realize that my grades was there. The number of students that still don't realize that that blue bar on the side of Blackboard can get expanded, like they think that they just don't get all of the things that everybody else does. And it's like, no, you're on a mobile device, like click on that blue line and I promise you it's there. Um, and it does, it ends up working out. So. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Um, I'm reading, uh, when your math projects include written components like summaries or explanation, can I assume you explicitly don't grade the writing? I don't. Um, my writing is not the best, I'm a math person. Um, Grammarly is my best friend. So I would never um, grade based on um, complete sentences and capitalizations and things like that. Do I um, tend to like look at it and say, like, did you mean this here? If it like is confusing the way it's worded. Um, but for the most part, I feel like a lot of the students probably use Grammarly because they're not, um, they're not <clears throat> giving me like really horrible um, things that I can't follow because I'm testing, do you understand, like, are you mastering the learning outcomes um, for my class? And so that's where that piece of it comes from. Um, I saw that, um, Jean Marie, you had your hand up. Did you have a question? Yeah, it goes back to what you were doing before. Um, just on the discussion board, one thing I do is I put um, a thread just for people who want to get in touch with each other for study groups so that they can talk to each other up there. That's a good idea too.
Are there any other questions? Marisha, we did it right on that 45 minutes too from last time. We had 45 minutes for the closing presentation and we were like right at that 45 minutes. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. And uh, we will add the recording to um, the CODL website so that it's there for anybody who wants to review. Lauren, thank I'll you. check in thank with you, you so about much, Anne. Okay. Thank you, that was thank you, Marcia. Thanks for having us and thanks for coming. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being part of our department. <laughs> <laughs>